The relatively good formability of metals compared to other materials is an important property of metals. The reason for this lies in the special metallic bond. The good formability is the basis for many manufacturing processes such as bending, deep drawing, or forging. However, not all metals are equally malleable. The different degrees of deformability are mainly due to different lattice structures. To understand this, a basic knowledge of the atomic processes involved in deformation is required. These will be discussed in more detail first. Basically, a distinction can be made between elastic and plastic deformation. Elastic deformation occurs when the atoms move only slightly when a relatively small force is applied. When the force is removed, the atoms return to their original position. After elastic deformation, the deformed workpiece completely returns to its original shape. In order to avoid permanent deformation, mechanically stressed components in machines, for example cylinder head bolts and engines, must only be elastically deformed. In contrast to elastic deformation, the force applied in plastic deformation is relatively large. This causes individual atomic planes to slide. The resulting displacements remain after the force is removed. The individual atomic planes no longer return to their original position, but have shifted by one or more atomic distances. The workpiece remains permanently deformed after the force is removed. In some manufacturing processes, such as forging, bending, or deep drawing, such plastic deformation is desired in order to bring the corresponding components permanently into the desired shape. Note that with every plastic deformation, the material is always also elastically deformed to a certain degree. This means that with plastic deformation, the material springs back somewhat after the force is removed. This is also referred to as springback. This springback must be taken into account when bending, for example. This makes it necessary to bend the workpiece beyond the desired bending angle in order to compensate for the springback. The atomic planes at which the atomic blocks shear off during plastic deformation are also called slip planes. After the atomic blocks have emerged from the material surface by one or more atomic distances, they become microscopically visible as slip steps. As the reflection behavior also changes when slip steps form, this becomes noticeable as a dulling of the surface at the corresponding deformation point. This is also the reason why the bend point of polished tubes often appears dull. Note that every plastic deformation process, regardless of whether it is a tensile, compressive, bending, torsional or shear stress, is ultimately due to a sliding of atomic blocks. However, due to the strong electrostatic forces between the individual atoms and the associated stability, the shape of the unit cell does not change permanently during deformation processes. A metal can be deformed well if there are many slip planes with as many slip directions as possible. This allows a deformation process to take place in many directions simultaneously without irreparably destroying the atomic structure. The combination of slip planes and slip directions is also called a slip system. For good deformability, a lattice structure should therefore have as many slip systems as possible. Note that the term slip system is ultimately synonymous with the term slip possibility. The more sliding possibilities an atomic structure has, the more the material can be deformed. The different types of lattice, such as face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic, and hexagonal closest pact, each have a different number of slip systems. This is the main reason for the different deformability of the corresponding metals. We will go into this in more detail later in the video. All deformation processes in metals are therefore based on the sliding of atomic layers, as just explained. However, this is only possible if a force is applied in the right way. A compression of the atomic structure would only lead to a compression of the lattice structure, but not to a sliding of the atomic layer on the slip plane shown in blue. Slipping, on the other hand, only occurs when the force acts in such a way as to cause a lateral displacement of the atomic structure. It therefore makes sense to classify forces according to their direction of action on surfaces. Forces that act perpendicularly on surfaces are called normal forces. Normal forces can basically be divided into tensile forces and compressive forces. In contrast, forces acting parallel to a surface are called shear forces. Whether a shear force is capable of causing an atomic plane to slide does not depend on the force alone. Of course, the size of the atomic plane to be sheared is also decisive. The larger the surface area of the atomic layer, the more bonding points there are between two atomic planes that have to be broken in order to slide. So it depends on the force per bond, or the force per surface area. Such area-related forces are then also called stresses. 
In the case of normal forces, these stresses are called normal stresses and in the case of shear forces they are called shear stresses. While normal stresses are denoted by the Greek letter sigma, shear stresses are given the Greek letter tau. However, both types of stress are defined identically as force per unit area. However, the fact that only shear stresses lead to the sliding off of atomic planes does not mean that normal stresses acting on a material cannot also lead to deformations. It must be taken into account that in a lattice structure there are usually many different atomic planes on which slipping can take place. An atomic or lattice plane is an arbitrary plane which is regularly occupied by atoms. In the case shown, for example, not only the horizontal atomic planes represent lattice planes, but also the planes running at an angle to them. These are also regularly occupied by atoms and thus represent atomic planes on which, in principle, sliding can take place. By decomposing the forces, it can now be quickly seen that although a force acts vertically downwards on the material surface, this leads to a shear force in the slip plane under consideration. While only normal stresses act on the surface of the material, shear stresses occur inside the material. A distinction must therefore always be made. While on a macroscopic level both shear and normal stresses lead to deformations, the deformation process on a microscopic level can always be traced back to shear stresses. To initiate a deformation process, certain critical resolved shear stresses must be exceeded in the slip planes, and especially in slip direction, so that shearing of the atomic planes occurs. Due to the bonding forces acting between the atoms, it is theoretically possible to predict at what critical shear stress this occurs. For metals, these values are typically between 1,000 and 3,000 newtons per square millimeter. Theoretically, therefore, a force of 1,000 to 3,000 newtons per square millimeter of atom surface must act to cause them to shear off. It is remarkable, however, that in reality only a fraction of this stress is needed to actually plastically deform a material. The experimental values are more in the single-digit range between 1 and 30 newtons per square millimeter. So in practice, Deformation already starts at much lower stress values than theoretically calculated. We go into this phenomenon in more detail in another video. One more remark on the term critical resolved shear stress. The term resolved means that the force or the shear stress acting in the slip plane must also be decomposed in slip direction. This is crucial because for energetic reasons, an atomic plane cannot slide equally in all directions, but only in certain energetically favorable directions. Only this stress resolved in slip direction is decisive for the sliding process, as it not only acts in the slip plane, but also in slip direction. With this basic understanding of the deformation processes in metals, we now go into more detail about the influence of the lattice structure on deformability. Let's first take another look at the cubic primitive lattice, which only contains atoms in the corners of the cube-shaped unit cell. In such a crystal structure, for example, the upper and lower sides of the cubes form lattice planes, which are shown here in blue. It is important to note that the lines drawn are for orientation only and do not represent bonds. Just because two atoms are connected by a line does not necessarily mean that there is a strong bond between them. At this point you should simply think away the drawn bars. In this way it quickly becomes clear that in cubic lattices, for example, not only the outer surfaces of the cubes form lattice planes, but also, as we have already seen, planes running at any angle to them. If shearing of entire atomic layers can take place at such lattice planes, these are the slip planes already mentioned. In principle, there are countless atomic planes in a lattice structure, but not all of them are suitable as slip planes under normal conditions. The reason for this is ultimately the electrostatic forces acting between the atoms, which bind the atomic planes together to a greater or lesser extent. In a lattice structure, those lattice planes are preferred as slip planes that have the greatest possible distance between them, as this means low attractive forces between the planes. In addition, the lattice planes should be as densely occupied with atoms as possible, so that only small displacements are necessary to reach a new state of equilibrium. This additionally reduces the energy required for slipping. For energy reasons, a slip plane cannot be moved equally well in every direction. For example, it is not possible to move a slip plane in the direction in which the stacking order would change. The illustrated example shows the most densely packed atomic planes of the face-centered cubic lattice. The green plane can only be moved in the three indicated directions. Only in these cases the stacking order is maintained when moving. Note that you can still see the red spheres through the gaps between the green spheres even if they are shifted. This applies both to the displacement to the right and to the diagonal displacement.
In contrast, a shift upwards in the indicated direction is not possible. In this case, the stacking sequence would change. The green layer would then be identical to the red layer. The lattice structure would then no longer consist of three differently aligned planes, but only of two. In this case, the face-centered cubic lattice would now have become a hexagonal closest packed lattice. For energetic reasons, however, such a change in the lattice structure is not easily possible. The forces required for this would be much too high, so that in practice no slipping takes place in this direction. For good deformability, a metal must therefore have not only a large number of different slip planes, but also the largest possible number of slip directions. Only this combination of the number of slip planes and the number of slip directions determines the total slip possibilities and thus the deformability. As already mentioned, such a sliding possibility is also called a slip system. It should be noted that good deformability does not necessarily mean that a lattice structure can already be deformed with low forces. Rather, good deformability means the property of being able to deform a lattice structure without damage, that means without the formation of cracks. This implies that a lattice structure should have as many slip systems as possible that allow displacement without damaging the structure. The different lattice structures have a different number of slip systems, both quantitatively and qualitatively. This is the main reason for the different ductility of the metals depending on the lattice type. Metals such as magnesium, cobalt, zinc or titanium can hardly be plastically deformed under normal conditions. What all these metals have in common is that they exist in a hexagonal close-packed lattice structure. This type of lattice obviously offers only a few slip systems. Metals such as aluminum, lead, copper and nickel, on the other hand, have very good formability. This is obviously due to their face-centered cubic structure, which offers many slip systems. The deformability of the body-centered cubic lattice lies between the two lattice types mentioned. Typical representatives of this structure are metals such as iron, chromium, molybdenum, and vanadium. Due to the good formability of the face-centered cubic lattice of copper and aluminum, or their alloys, these metals are often used as so-called wrought metals. In contrast, the metals magnesium and zinc are mainly used as cast metals due to their hardly deformable lattice. The body-centered cubic lattice has basically six slip planes on which the lattice blocks preferentially slip. These are the planes which, in addition to two atoms on each edge of the cube, also include the body-centered atom and the diagonally opposite atoms. For each slip plane there are two possible slip directions. These correspond to the surface diagonals of the slip planes marked in yellow. Other slip directions are ruled out for the time being because of the electrostatic forces acting on them. The BCC lattice thus essentially has six slip planes, each with two slip directions, resulting in a total of 12 slip possibilities and thus 12 slip systems. For larger forces, other atomic planes can act as slip planes in addition to those mentioned so far. However, as these slip planes are only activated at correspondingly higher forces due to the larger electrostatic forces, they do not significantly determine the deformability at low forces. This leaves a total of 12 mainly activated slip planes in the body-centered cubic lattice. On the other hand, if all slip possibilities were taken into account, a total of 48 slip systems would result. In contrast to the body-centered cubic lattice, the face-centered cubic lattice has a total of 4 slip planes on which the atomic blocks prefer to slip. These are the most densely packed planes which run diagonally through the unit cell. For each of these slip planes there are 3 slip directions. As explained before, this corresponds to the directions where the stacking order is maintained when the plane is moved. The FCC lattice, like the BCC lattice, thus has a total of 12 slip systems, consisting of 4 slip planes, each with 3 slip directions. Due to the equal number of slip systems, one could jump to the conclusion that both the body-centered and the face-centered cubic lattice are equally well deformable. In practice, however, it turns out that the face-centered cubic lattice has a significantly higher deformability. This is due to the fact that the slip planes are more densely packed in the face-centered lattice compared to the body-centered lattice. As explained before, the higher packing density requires less displacement until a new equilibrium state is reached. This reduces the energy required for slipping accordingly. Sliding processes therefore take place with less force in the face-centered cubic lattice despite the same number of slip systems. Slip planes on which the atoms are maximally densely packed and on which thus preferably a sliding of atomic planes takes place are also called main slip planes. Such densely packed planes are not present in the body-centered lattice structure. So note, in addition to the main criterion of the quantity of slip systems, 
the quality of the slip planes also plays a role in the deformability. Unlike the face-centered cubic lattice with a total of four primary slip planes, the hexagonal closest packed lattice has only one primary slip plane. This is the hexagonal base of the unit cell. There are three slip directions for this slip plane, so the HCP lattice has a total of three slip systems. The hexagonal lattice therefore has a relatively low deformability compared to the cubic lattices due to the low number of slip systems. Note that only the non-parallel planes are relevant for determining the number of slip planes, which can therefore be activated independently. The planes above the base surface are ultimately identical to the base surface, they are just offset from each other. With the hexagonal closest packed lattice additional slip planes can be activated with greater force. For example, the outer surfaces of the unit cell can also serve as slip planes. However, this requires very high forces, which is why the deformability of metals with hexagonal lattice is very low under normal conditions. As a rule of thumb for good deformability of a lattice structure, there should be at least five slip systems so that the material can deform in all directions. The table shown summarizes the characteristics of the three lattice types. Typical metals are named as examples for each lattice structure. However, it should be noted that some metals can change their lattice structure due to external influences such as pressure and temperature. Although iron has a body-centered cubic lattice at room temperature, it is face-centered cubic above 911 degrees Celsius. From a temperature of 1,392 degrees Celsius, the atomic structure of iron changes back to the body-centered cubic lattice before the melting temperature of 1,536 degrees Celsius is reached and the lattice structure dissolves. This transition from the moderately deformable BCC lattice to the much more deformable FCC lattice is also the reason why iron or steel is heated during forging. Titanium also has the ability to change its lattice structure, changing from hexagonal to body-centered cubic at a temperature of 882 degrees Celsius. Such a property of metals to change into other lattice structures depending on temperature or pressure is called allotropy or polymorphism. The cause of the allotropy lies in the more favorable energetic conditions that arise at the corresponding temperature, so that the lattice structure that is no longer stable decomposes into the more stable modification. The different lattice modifications of a polymorphic metal are identified by a Greek letter placed in front of the element symbol. For example, the hexagonal lattice structure of titanium at room temperature is called alpha titanium. After the first lattice transformation, it is called beta titanium. A further transformation at the next higher temperature would be called gamma. However, no further lattice transformation takes place in titanium.